Hello all, this is Dr. Dave Maslach talking about reciprocity.com. The E is spelled with a three, you could check it out. So I'm a professor of innovation strategy and entrepreneurship. And in this particular video, I really want to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of different research methodologies, you know, things like surveys, for example, experiments, um, field research, sort of historical archival data, that kind of stuff, that kind of analysis. I'm not going to get into sort of specific um, nitty gritties of the different research methodologies because a lot of that kind of stuff you can find in you know a basic research methods book whatever it is maybe you're in sociology psychology um, strategy I'm in a college of business so I and I teach strategy and you know there might be I don't know what else economics you can find out all these kind of stuff in these different subfields or these different fields in different methodologies but in this particular sort of thesis help series what i try to do is help out phd students um, graduate students and master students so anybody that's in that area that doesn't really kind of that that has these sort of difficult questions that people want to ask but they can't sort of ask their supervisor or they find it difficult to ask their advisors that kind of stuff um, so it's just kind of stuff that I have learned along the way and I just wanted to help you out in terms of you know just making your life easier <laughs> YouTube's kind of like the or Google is kind of like your private diary right you can sort of look for this kind of stuff and this is information that I would wish I would have had at your stage and I'm just putting it out to the world just to be as helpful as I possibly can um, particularly for this uh, the reciprocity project and um, that's it so you know what are these different re uh, research methodologies what are the advantages so the, the first thing that you should know is that every research method methodology has advantages and disadvantages and you have to be sort of really cognizant of that in fact it would be a good exercise for you to sort of articulate what those advantages are and disadvantages and write them down into you know a, a couple of pages particularly if you're choosing one over the other that's actually can go into a thesis right you can go in your dissertation sort of di discuss why you chose one or over the other and and the limitations of one particular methodology over the other it's kind of really um, a nice way to do things there's a lot of citations out there that sort of talks about that kind of stuff um, but the other thing the research methodology you choose sort of dictates your career path right so um, it's going to determine where you're going to go and how hard it's going to be to do research and how productive you're on and this is especially going to be really important early on in your career um, so you should be really just cognizant of these sort of method uh, limitations disadvantages and advantages of these different research methodologies early on um, it's kind of the reason why i'm actually doing this reciprocity project is I discovered that the methodology I was using, so I'm an um, engineer, and, and sort of originally as an engineer, trained a bunch in econo econometrics and try to understand that world as much as possible, but, and, and to analyze archival data, but then I realized it was really tricky to do. There's lots of sort of nuances, I guess, that are going on with that. Um, and so I tr I'm trying to actually create the reciprocity project to do more um, field experimental research to, to get that more valid insights about how um, human beings work and how managers actually work. Um, so you can actually look at what I'm doing there. And in fact, it's going to benefit you. I tried to actually make it so it's going to benefit you. It's a sharing economy proofreading platform where I, I think lots of people have anxiety with getting feedback. And it's just to get I created this system so that you can get feedback on your writing and to do it really easily and just kind of in a fun way. But anyways, so what are these different sort of different uh, items, I guess, criteria to sort of assess what you should do and what you should work on in your graduate program. Um, so the first one is think about validity, right? And there's kind of two different sources of validity. You can look them up, external validity and internal validity. External validity is how much it can be generalized, particular results that you have can be generalized as well as internal validity is how sort of um, sound it is in terms of having a causal understanding of what's going on and and the, the key thing is is that there's often a trade-off between external and internal validity the strongest methodology you can choose to have internal validity is going to be some sort of experiment right so some sort of lab experiment it's going to be really really rigorous 
um, if you're using an analog of some sort in the lab, so if you're using, so for example, mice as an analog for humans, it's not going to be as, um, you're not going to have the external validity, right? Because it's going to be hard to generalize to human beings. And there's all sorts of different steps along the way to, to generalize from mice to, to men. Hey, that's cool, right? From mice to men. Um, but you know that you can you can have very strong internal validity because you can control the environment really well a lot more than you can with human beings for example um, if you're doing like kind of sociological research then you might think about you know the the internal validity that you have with a particular methodology that you're doing in terms of maybe you know field research it's going to be loosey-goosey in terms of the internal validity or the, the yeah the internal validity that you have because there's lots of different factors so field research would be going out and doing surveys doing um uh, I guess not surveys, but like interviews uh, going out in, you know, sometimes you can think of um, um, uh, surveys as well, but going out doing interviews, going out and um, doing sort of ethnographies, going out and doing participant observations, just getting and getting your hands dirty in the real world. Um, it's going to be really hard to sort of, you know, you, 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 in the immediate surroundings, you're going to have pretty high internal validity with what you're looking at. But then, you know, to get out and to understand causal mechanisms, that's that's really it's it's a little bit less clear. You're going to have a lot of what's going to end up happening happening when you do that is you can have a lot of sort of factors at play. And any one of those could be sort of leading to sort of causal factors. What you're going to do is understand so the, the, the depth of what's going on, right? So you can understand oh, all these different factors are affecting these relationships, but you're not going to be able to put your finger on which one is probably the most important um, because you're not gathering that kind of data. It doesn't lend itself to that very well. But, you know, in terms of external validity, it has pretty high external validity because you're getting your hands dirty in the real world, right? Um, so so that's, that's kind of the trade-off that you want to think about um, historical analytical data that's why I was I, I was looking into that is is because it has high internal validity and external validity to some degree because you're looking at sort of paths of what people have done in the past and I was kind of sold on that for a long time but then there's um, there's a lot of sort of statistical problems behind the scenes uh, I don't want to get into that but it's really hard to establish um, sort of causal understanding because you're not actually manipulating anything. You're not getting in there and getting your hands dirty and you can't really get any sort of causal understanding of what's going on, right? So um, the second thing that's, that's important that you should think about is time and resources that you have and really what you should be thinking about, what are you actually good at doing, right? So I know that some people are really good at talking and interacting with people. You can tell that I'm probably not that kind of person, right? So I didn't do a lot of that sort of interview kind of stuff. Um, yeah, but if you are that kind of person that's great at that, then maybe you should look at that. Maybe other people are really good at sort of getting their hands dirty statistically, so you should get into and look at sort of archival data and thinking about that. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe you're, you're sort of a real perfectionist and you understand sort of all the different steps along the way and you really kind of get really fine grained, then you should get into experiments, right? Because that's what experimental design and experimental methodology is about being a perfectionist to a large degree, getting things really, really nailed down so that you can rule out all the possible threats to um, yeah, yeah, uh, internal validity, right? Um, so the third thing that you should think about is uncertainty. The These methodologies, um, there is tremendous advantages with doing, say, experiments, for example, in terms of internal validity, but at the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the actual outcome is going to be. In fact, you will find out that a lot of people do a lot of experiments before they actually get sort of the results that they would like. And in fact, that is kind of a dicey, there's been a lot of backlash to that lately in the last, uh, I don't know, five years or so to that kind of methodology of doing that. But lots of people do that kind of stuff to get sort of interesting results. And that's because, you know, the world is messy. And when you do experiments, you're trying to sort of boil things down and you realize that a lot of results are just kind of null results, right? But you can, the, the way that the state of science is, is hard to publish null results, results that are just kind of like, eh, there's nothing there. 
Um, so you have to sort of dig down and sort of discover things and find things that are interesting and, and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, when you're doing that, you're kind of getting really kind of idiosyncratic results and you're getting really deep down into the idiosyncrasies. And it could be really sensitive to a lot of different factors, right? That, um, that factors that are in your control rather than sort of the world that you're looking at. And that's really what the sort of debate is all about. Um, the other thing that you should think about, and, and, and you might not get, so if you do experiments, for example, you might not get results that you're interested in. Um, that, that actually happened to me with archival data. I was going through and analyzing this. I'm like, why isn't this not working, right? It's one of those things where you're pulling out your hair and it just is that the the context that I was looking at was a lot different than what people have looked at the, in the past. And, and sort of the theory wasn't sort of molding very well onto what I was doing. And so I had to really think about things in a lot different way um, compared to what, what was going on in the past. And it's been a lot of work to sort of figure that out. Um, and so, oh, the, the fourth thing that you should be thinking about in terms of research methodologies, advantages and disadvantages, think about the acceptance that you have and, or the research methodology acceptance in the particular field that you have. So I know in marketing, um, so rigorous surveys, and so, so surveys that are kind of one-off, one, single individual surveys, that's not going to fly now. But if you have a really rigorous sort of experimental kind of style surveys and that are doing multiple, multiple studies, for example, that's going to be really, really rigorous and that's going to fly in that field. Um, if you have, but, but, you know, years ago, you could have just done a really simple sort of test, a simple um, survey, that kind of thing. But now, um, you know, it's, it's changed a lot. Even with sort of doing historical analytical data, um, sometimes you're going to have to, now that the, the way that the, the state of science is, particularly in my field, you can't just do archival analysis. You have to actually find sort of causal understanding. And that's the reason why I'm doing reciprocity. But as well as you might be able to have to do interviews and stuff like that, right? You have to dig down deep into sort of understanding what's going on, right? You just need to understand the mechanisms. And because it's you're, you're kind of like this person and you're kind of naive with the setting and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And um, you have to dig down into sort of dig down into what's going on, right? So that's the, that's the, the key thing. Um, and, and you just have to figure out that, that what you're doing and you have to figure out whether the particular methodology is going to be an acceptance in, in that field or not, in the field that, that you're currently in. Um, and the, the, the fifth thing is, is that the thinking about in terms of gathering knowledge that you possibly have. So um, this goes again, this goes again to the whether you're good at something or not. So you have to think about you know, why the, the methodology that you have, maybe it's stati some statistical techniques, a lot of times it's not gonna be covered in the department that you're in. So you have to go actually go out and get a lot of this information from other departments to understand what's going on. Um, you might actually have to study up yourself and go and, and re read the journal articles and figure that kind of stuff out. Um, watching YouTube videos, right? Uh, there might be a lot of sort of discovery along the way if you don't have that additional, that knowledge. Some people get a boost because they have some knowledge in certain areas. Um, a, a caution on that note to sort of base things on your uh, existing knowledge. The reason why you get into academia is to actually learn, learn new, new things, right? Um, and to advance the field in the state of science. So you have to actually go and learn new things, which is gonna be hard. Uh, when you're in graduate school, you should be learning new things by going and doing the hard things, right? It's going to be harder when you're doing it on your own. So going and getting statistical courses and stuff like that, that's going to benefit you a lot um, going forward. That would have been hard to sort of gather that data on yourself or gather that knowledge on yourself. So you, you should be looking at that. So these different techniques, um, so you have to play up what is what you're knowledgeable and good at, but at the same time, you know, going to towards something that you would actually like to understand and have a great depth of understanding with that particular kind of field, right? That thing that, that you're doing. So, um, you know, what would I do in your circumstance and going forward with what you're doing is I would really, in terms of deciding a research methodology or deciding which one to go, you know, I would ask your peers and sort of get a good understanding of what they're doing. I would also ask your senior advisors and supervisors and ask them what they're doing. And then finally, um, 
you know, the, the best thing is to go into articles in advance or the articles for the current year. You know, it's now it's 2018. So you go into 2018 articles of the best journals in your field and look to see what they're doing and just kind of try to replicate what they're doing as much as you possibly can and try to get to, you know, some future state and sort of you're forecasting where the field is going by based on the methodologies that are currently in the journals at that time. Because there is there's fads and fashions that comes in and out. Um, some methodologies are really popular sometimes, you know, quantitative sort of analysis was really popular 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And now qualitative stuff is becoming a lot more popular and, and sort of well established in, in our field anyways. Um, and it keeps sort of ebb and flowing like that, right? It keeps going, things are, are, there's fads and fashions all the time. But what is, what is useful and what's not useful in your field in terms of research methodologies? So if you like this video, um, do me an old thumbs up as well as make sure that you go and watch some of the other videos that helps me uh, get the word out because, um, yeah, it just helps me get the word out. You're amazing anyways uh, for following along. You're a total... Um, you know, just total badass, <laughs> to be honest, to get to this point. So um, thank you so much. Take care and have a wonderful day. Bye.